Welcome to lunchtime. Whoa! So glad to have you here at the table. Today, we're just going to have a good time right here at the lunch table. And you're going to notice that I have on my hat. And the reason for my hat is because of the fact that home cooks wear many different hats as they work within the kitchen. There are so many different things that home cooks need to do. Uh, some things are a need. Some things are things that they desire to do. And certainly within the kitchen, there are many different items that need to be taken care of. So I welcome all of you right here to this lunch table because we are going to have an opportunity to uh, take a look at all of that. So welcome to all of you. And uh, I'm glad to have you here. So lunchtime, and as you can see, lunchtime is going to take on a springy look. So I'm going to come out of our hat. Now, before I come out of this hat, I do want you to know I am wearing the hat that belonged to my mother. Yes, I have several of her hats and she's gone on to a better place. And uh, but I kept her hats. And, you know, to be honest with you, I don't have a chance to wear them very often, but, and certainly I am uh, wearing it today because I want you to see and to get, and remember the feeling that when we put on our hats, it's just like when we step into our aprons, we are ready to do some creating. And the creating may be a recipe. The creating may be creating a beautiful kitchen for, for your family and for yourself, most of all. Or it could be that you're deciding that this is going to be the place where you are going to be the game changer for your family. And, you know, sometimes as hard as we work within our families and all of the effort that we put into our families, that sometimes things just don't always go the way you plan. So because of that, we have to tweak some of the things that we do. So we've got a couple of things that we're going to look at today. And I'm going to be working, trying to work back and forth between our banners. So the first part of the show today we're going to talk about those many hats that our that we wear as home cooks. So let me put my glasses on because you know I usually have notes and hello to all of you. I'm so glad that you're here. If you are here with us, yeah, um, please let us know, give us a wave if you're new to uh, our lunch table. And certainly if you are new to the lunch table, we welcome you and uh, hope that you will certainly take the time to come back. So welcome to President's Day. There's a lot going on. Now, today, this is also, you know, this month we've got presidents being celebrated. We have Black history that is being celebrated. And today, I wanted to bring someone to you that uh, she is one of those people that I have looked up to. And I have to say, yes, she has gone on. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about her because she was a powerful lady. And that power came within the kitchen. The things that she was able to do within the kitchen is just tremendous. And how not only did she continue to build her family, she was able to, to build a community and eventually moved that community, got larger and larger, and uh, she was a game changer. So I'm going to bring to you one of my favorite, favorite people, and that is Leah Chase. And she was known as the queen of Creole cooking. Now, you know, Leah Chase, 
as I said, passed in her late, late eighties. And, uh, but she got the, she got the name of queen of Creole cooking because she learned how to work spices, how to um, bring people to the table through the love and the inspiration. She was able to do all of that. And yet and still, she had a plan. She had a routine. She had all of that. And it was powerful to see how she worked. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. This lady started back with, uh, I'm trying to get her date, January 1923. And she passed in June of 2019. And so she lived a wonderful life. Today, she is still thought of as one of, uh, as an influencer. She was an influencer all throughout her life, as well as an influencer, even after she's gone on to the great beyond. So keep in mind, I think how that influences me is that number one, we never give up. Whatever it is that we really want to do, whatever our goals are, we want to make sure that we are staying on board and that we are determined enough to move toward that goal and get it done. So um, she grew up in uh, Louisiana. She had an African, Spanish, uh, French heritage and uh, spoke a variety of languages. Now, the irony of it is, is that as powerful as she became, she started with very humble beginnings. I mean, very humble, lived on a farm. She um, talked about the fact, and I'm gonna introduce a couple of her cookbooks to you that uh, I have been perusing and using and, uh, she was about six when the Great Depression came along. And, you know, I, I think back to our time, of, and, and to be honest with you, we had great food insecurities. And you can remember back the past couple of years, we had, we had some issues with food and how food was arriving at the grocery stores. And we started to get a little anxious about the fact that the things that we expected to be on the shelf weren't necessarily there. But at the age of six, she learned very quickly. She watched her family navigate and her family was able to um, survive with 10 children, guys, 10 children. And uh, they ate off the land. And she talks about the fact that her clothes were, uh, were handmade. They were made from flour sacks back at that time. That, uh, and they were the sacks that held both flour and rice in that particular area. And she said they actually lived off of these things. They had uh, okra, you know, that's familiar to, to Louisiana. They had peas, they had greens, and they survived. And th these are things that they actually grew on their farm. And, that, and they had strawberries because they also had a portion that was a strawberry farm. And, uh, and, her, farm, and her father owned the, these areas, these farms. And so it was an integral part for her to be able to use, to learn from what she saw within her family, the influence of her, of her father and her mother upon her, and then to take what she had learned and what she had seen and to be able to build that into something that was powerful for her. Now, she was fortunate enough that um, she met a young man who was uh, a jazz player. And, you know, you go from one thing to another. And uh, she she married this jazz player, Dookie Chase. 
and his parents now this is this is a funny part his parents owned a little uh corner street corner stand and two things went on at the street corner stand which is rather funny they own they sold tickets a lot like lottery tickets and they also sold homemade po' boy sandwiches. And you know, po' boy sandwiches are delicious and they are well known down in Louisiana. Now, as she came, when she came into the family, of course she learned their technique of how they prepared their po' boy family, po' boy sandwiches within the family. And so she took what she learned put in her creativity and started to develop. She brought family, her family influence in, and she took their menu once they got married and they found a place where they could open up. And actually it started small as a small restaurant. And she started to influence people with good food, good eating, clean establishment. All of those things were very important to her. And um, so she continued that for, for a very long time. Now, uh, not only was she a game changer as far as restaurants and being an influencer as far as, far as how you can go from this big to something grand is the fact that... Um, she was an influencer politically and um, had presidents who came to her restaurant. She held community meetings in her restaurant. So not only did she provide food just to those who came by to, to uh, eat at her establishment, but also this was a meeting place where at a certain time she would close the doors and whomever was supposed to come in or who wanted to use her place for their particular function, they were able to come in and do that. Um, during Hurricane Katrina, her, place, her, her restaurant was flooded. So the uh, people who were... Um, in, who knew that she was such an influencer and knew how valuable her restaurant was, those people had a huge fundraiser. And that fundraiser set her in the right direction of repairing her establishment. In fact, they moved it to another location and she prepared the gumbo. So she served gumbo and gumbo, and they sold gumbo and po' boy sandwiches to those who wanted them and those who came. And they made a tremendous amount of money, which enabled her to be able to improve her establishment and for her dream really to be realized. And one more thing that she was able to do, she was a painter. Ha, huh. a painter. She went from the home cook to the wife to the restaurant tour to an influencer in the community and also painted. And her paintings, she's not only put her paintings into her restaurant, she also hung paintings from the the artist in the area so that they could see what value, great value art was to, to the life around them. So she was a valuable person to the area. The cool thing is, and then we'll move on to what we were going to do today, is that uh, back in 2012, an artist uh, came to her. His name was Gustav Blanc the third and he was also an artist and he did a painting several paintings of her and the funny thing is is that now that painting is hanging is on and uh it's being let's see actually it's being hung in 
actually in the restaurant for of uh, Leah Chase at the Dookie Chase's restaurant. That's what they call it, Dookie Chase. And her painting then went on to be hung in the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Wow, that's a big thing. Now, of course, it was fun because of the fact that they were able to hang this portrait of her for the other artists. But just imagine, just imagine your painting be your or your your image being in the Smithsonian. How powerful is that? And the funny thing is, is that she says she looked at it and he asked her if he if if she thought the painting was good and that it was an accurate rendering of her. And uh, she laughed. And she said, uh, well, yeah, you you got it right. Looks looks just like me. She said, but you know, you could have made me look like Halle Berry or Lena Horne, but instead you had to make it just look like me. And so they both got a good laugh out of that. So she definitely was an influencer. She had a great sense of humor and what a fantastic chef she was. Now, for the month of March, we are going to be working. Let me take this down. And that's not the one I wanted. Okay, okay, okay. All right, we're back to where we are. Da da. Uh, we're gonna be take. We're gonna be working through down home healthy, and down home healthy is a book that uh, Leah Chase worked with um, the National Cancer Institute and uh, all of the restaurants, uh, all of the recipes that are in this book are hers. And this is the reason why she decided that she was going to uh, put this book together. And it's because of the fact, this is how she starts out. She said that things aren't, things sure aren't the way they were. She said, back in the day, she said, kids growing up had brother, lots of brothers and sisters, and they thought nothing of getting up early and walking miles and running around the countryside picking wild berries or whether it's blackberries or strawberries or vegetables or working on a farm, like in her case, for her parents. Um, she said they that the mom would send them miles down the road to uh, a farm stand to buy butter beans or mustard greens, whatever the case may be. But by the time they got back, they were back just in time for a big breakfast, and then they didn't get to sit down then. They had to head right back out. They had lessons that had to be done. They had chores that needed to be done. And she said, you know, nowadays, we just aren't doing all the walking, all the, the work that used to be done. So because of that, our meals need to be healthier. And, you know, we, we've spent the past couple of weeks talking about those things that home cooks can do in their kitchen in order to uh, in order to improve the nutritional value of their meals. So some of her suggestions were some of ours that we've talked about. So let me tell you what she said. She this is what she shot for. She said she wanted to make sure in this book that uh, her family was and those who needed it because she added these recipes to her restaurant menu. She wanted to make sure that she was serving a variety of foods. She also wanted to make sure that um, she herself, she tried to maintain a healthy weight. And her logic was she didn't need to tell anybody, you know, whether they needed to lose weight or whatever. And she and she said she was quick to tell her doctor that that wasn't necessary either, because she expected those who were thinking that that they would set the example. If you can set the example, 
In other words, if you can walk the walk, then people will see what you're doing and want to do the same thing. She said she would like to see uh, those who were coming into her, their re her restaurant, that they would choose a diet that was low in fat. And she tried to make changes in her recipe and yet and still keep the same flavor profile. Um, she tried to lessen the amount of saturated fat and, of course, lessen cholesterol because that was an issue. She tried to make sure that the things she served had plenty of vegetables, there were fruit, and there were lots of grain products that were also available. She sugar in moderation. Have desserts on the menu? Absolutely. But she, you know, provided it, but it was up to the person who was sitting there in her restaurant to make the decisions as to what they were going to do. So she developed the idea for herself because it started within of uh, cutting things in half and uh, being very moderate with what she was doing. She also was very moderate with salt because she knew at that point that sodium was an issue. And she said, of course, if you drink alcoholic beverages, that that should also be in moderation. And she did not encourage, you know, over drinking there where she was. So she, in this book, gives you tips and hints along the way that will, and, res, and great recipes that will help us follow dietary guidelines. Because just as we have been trying during February to talk about uh, heart health, cancer is certainly one of those things that is also affected by sugars, excess sugars, excess salt. Uh, we need to try to stay as healthy as we can. All of those things are a part of that. So she felt like that if we started on a good road to good health, then more than likely we would be able to extend our life as well as have a valuable, thriving, older life as we got older. So anyway, she goes into, um, she goes into lots of her uh, recipes and she worked with a couple of other chefs and um, she, t she even gives you a guide as to uh, selections, what are the healthier selections, and those things that you would try to stir, stir away from. So we, um, you will have an opportunity to take a look at that should you decide that you want to look at down-home healthy, down-home meals, but with a very nutritious and lower calorie, I say lower calorie, not light because it's not lower calorie because she encourages you to use moderation. She also had a second book that uh, everyone was so thrilled with when she brought it out. It's called And Still I Cook. This book, came about late in life for her. And uh, she said to remember that you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. And so, uh, and in this particular book, she actually gives you her original recipes. And I tell you what, it is just fun going through and reading some of the things that she talks about as she works through each of these recipes. So for those of you are who, uh, this is one of those books that I'll probably keep for a very, very, very long time and still pass it on to someone else who would like to uh, also look and be inspired because she was definitely a great inspiration as well as her husband. The two of them worked well together. They were a well-oiled team and uh, they influenced the Louisiana area.
Now, I'm going to take a moment and see what you guys are talking about because um, I'm going to go back up. And uh, hello, hello to all of you. I'm so glad you're here at the, at the lunch table. Nitty T said the Dookie Chase restaurant in New Orleans is very good. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm glad you like it. And she's a great lady. She was a great lady. Um, Sue said she's been there, but she hadn't been there for several years. Uh, let's see. Michelle says, what a story and such a beautiful life lived. You are absolutely right. You know, I can only hope, can only hope. And, and you know, that's one of those things that as you think about time, you want to be able to look back and think that the life you've lived has, has been one that has influenced somebody. It doesn't mean you have to influence the world, even though she did and was such a humble lady. You know, that was that was the powerful thing. The things that she did, she just did because she was a driven lady. That was her personality. True type A. And uh, but she did what she did in a loving way. And people just absolutely loved her. Uh, hello, pretty things. Glad to see you. Glad you were able to come by. Uh, Sue said, unfortunately, she hadn't been able to uh, go back to New Orleans since Katrina. And uh, we had a trip planned to New Orleans, but didn't get to make it. We had some, a family situation that came through and didn't, didn't get there. Oh, how sweet. Uh, Michelle says she just added a couple of her big books to her list on Amazon. So you can get and she can get them when she's able. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, pretty Things says, thanks for sharing. She certainly uh, watches her sodium intake. And, you, and you're absolutely right. There's usually already quite a bit of salt in processed foods. So that's one of those things that we can keep in mind as we're selecting the items that we're going to put into our food that um, salt is only a last, a pinch, just to make sure that we have good flavor. Um, let's see. Next today, we are going to take a look. Okay. Yep. Guess what? It's that time again. We're going to be making our kitchen spring checklist. And you're going, oh, no, not the spring checklist. Yes, we're going to be taking a look at that spring checklist. So I'm going to get you over here, add us in, and uh, we'll be able to click through and uh, know exactly what it is that we're going to be talking about today. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting day, an interesting time, and we got things to do. You know, it's always busy. Now, for those of you who are out there who are new, don't forget to certainly like and subscribe to the channel because we're always talking about things that affect home cooks. And home cooks are important. They're important to our home, our family. Most important, they're important to the world. And, you know, we just, it's one house at a time when you think about home cooks and the influence that we have globally. One cook, one home. If you can change here in your home, you can make major changes to the world. And so we're going to talk about that. So we're going to be taking a look at our spring cleaning. And uh, I certainly wanted to uh, influence you to slay the day because 
we've got a lot to do. You can see I've got supplies all stacked up, ready to go. And we are going to take a look at our kitchen. And um, the cool thing is, is that, you know, a lot of times when, when you think about spring cleaning, you know, you think, whoo, I got a week. I got to get all this done. But let's think about the fact. Let's put a calendar together and or you'll put a calendar together and um, you'll be able to plan out your spring cleaning in such a way that it's not overwhelming. Now, first, we are going to take inventory of our kitchen. We're going to start from the ceiling to the floor. Now. I actually started this inventory during February. I mean, during, yes, early part of February into January. And uh, in looking at some things that needed to get done. So, for instance, um, starting at the ceiling, there was a place where we had had a problem with the leak and uh, from the laundry room, which is right above the kitchen. And so while it had been painted, it had been repaired years ago, um, it was starting to lose its perfect look. So we made sure that we put it on the list. We found uh, a contractor to do it, and he was able to restore that ceiling back to its perfection. So that's where you start. You start at the top and work your way down. Now, even when you're cleaning, just normal everyday cleaning, we start from the top and we work our way down so that the floor is the last thing that you do. And that's because dust, dirt, little pieces of whatever it may be are going to fall. And, you know, you can certainly take a moment at the end of that particular day, get things sweeped up. And then the next time you start, then you're going to start at your higher height and continue to work down. Now, so we're working our inventory. We're going to be starting from ceiling to floor. Now, for those of you who uh, get the newsletter, you're going to have a lot of this. Plus, you're going to have a spring cleaning checklist that's going to be in your newsletter that we're going to talk about. So you will have my idea of an easy way to be able to break it down into small segments because we don't want to get overwhelmed and you can decide how many days you want to be able to do it so you're going to develop your checklist of tasks and and then the materials that you're going to need because for instance depending upon the type of floor that you have you may need to bring equipment in. If you have carpeting, you may need a carpet cleaner that you need to acquire if you don't have one at home. Or you need to clean yours up because it hasn't been used a while. Or you may need to purchase the, 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 the liquid, the carpet cleaning solution that needs to go into it. If your vacuum's looking a little ragged and it's just not picking up the way it is, then this might be a good time to to give it a little love or donate it and acquire a new one. Um, for us, it wasn't the hand vac, the hand, our hand vacuum. We had had for quite a while, but you know what? It just wasn't doing the job. So the big guy found a new one that is like Jaws it picks up, it will pick you up if you stand still. That's how well it worked. And uh, so I, I will link that below. So if you need a good hand vac that is really strong and does a good job, then certainly, you know, that's an option. But this is a time to think about those things so that once you start, you have everything you need in place and ready to go. And so um, working through your checklist. So supplies are going to be a part of the checklist. The tasks that need to be accomplished. 
So as you're standing and you're looking around the top of your ceiling, when was the last time you dusted the, the corners and the cobwebs around? Now, you know, technically we should try to do it at least once a month that we have taken care of all the cobwebs. But you know, for some of us, we're working every day. So because of that, you may not have gotten to it. And so that may be something that you need to put on your checklist. Also, if you have cabinets where the top of the cabinets are, are exposed and you have things that have decorative items that have been sitting on top of your cabinets that you probably, because it's high, you probably haven't touched it for a while. And so those items need to come down and get clean. You need to clean that upper cabinets. Remember, top to the floor. So you're starting at the top. Um, you also want to make sure that you're inventorying those things that are up on top of that cabinet, are up on top of the, that refrigerator that you're looking at and you're not in love with anymore. That happens. You know, it's like, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I, I really liked that 10 years ago, but I'm just not feeling that look anymore. Now is the time that when you bring it down to decide, uh, do you love it or is it time for it to go somewhere else? And, you know, sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to donate it. Now, sometimes it's good to donate it because you decided, uh-uh, I don't, I don't want this at all. But it may mean that this item may look better in another room. And you may find that when you sit it in another room, <gasps> wow, it gave it a whole new look a whole new feeling. So you're making a change. The tops of your cabinets are going to look different and you aren't throwing something out that you liked, but you didn't like it up on the cabinet anymore. You may decide that you want to go more mental, mid minimalist and you want to make sure that what you're looking at is a little lighter, brighter, fresher looking, because certainly at spring, we want a fresh look. So you want something as new as you possibly can. So when you look up there, you're going, I really like that. You know, I've changed that whole look. And you, you don't have to do a lot. It could be just you're lightening it. So make sure that you take a look at that. Okay, think in small segments. Break your task into small jobs that are going to last about 15 to 30 minutes at a time. 15 to 30 minutes of working at that task for your spring clean in your kitchen is not bad at all. 15 minutes, maybe 20, depending upon what it is. And uh, the reason for that is because we don't want to be overwhelmed. There are other things that we need to do besides just standing in our kitchen working on a job. You know, so if you break it into small tasks, then at the end of the day, you can say, voila, I got it done. Check. And it makes you feel successful. So break those tasks down into smaller jobs. So say, for instance, day one, we're making, we're, we're taking our inventory, we're going through, we're making our list, looking at our list, seeing what things we need to add. See, there may be some things on, on the checklist that I'm going to suggest for you that you may not need to do. So you can either already check that off or just draw a line through it, because maybe that's a part of your weekly routine or every couple of weeks routine. So you've already done it and that's fine but you do want to make sure that they get done. Down, small segments to avoid getting overwhelmed. Now, let me see if I can put this 
in such a way that it's a little better. Okay, starting at the top, wipe down your walls. Wipe down your walls. Do you have to do it by hand? Nope, don't have to do it by hand. But it may be nice for you to be able to do that with a Swiffer and say your cleaning solution, whatever it is that you like. I use um, Mrs. Myers, so I find a fragrance that I'm going to be using for the spring. I like their, um, it's called uh, Honeysuckle. And um, so I'll make a solution of that with my um, microfiber towels, put them on my Swiffer, and there we go. And I get my walls wiped down. I get the uh, vacuum and I'm dusting and vacuuming the tops of the cabinets if when I had open cabinets and the tops of I didn't put on here but also the top of your refrigerator make sure you're taking off those high cleaning up those high areas if you have a uh, trim that is at the top of your ceiling in your kitchen that's a good time to get all that wiped down. Starting at the top, we're working our way down. Um, if you have light fixtures, obviously they're going to, going to be from your ceiling, then this is a time to really give them a good cleaning so that later when you're cleaning, you can dust them and keep going because you know you have already given them a good cleaning. This is also a good time to, um, to um, replace any, any bulbs that may be bad. You know, sometimes your fixtures are so high that um, you may have a bulb or two that you may not have changed. So this is a good time to be able to do that and to work your way down. That's a day one right there, getting the walls clean, vacuuming and dusting the tops of the cabinets and cleaning your light fixtures. Voila, your 15 to 20 to 30 minutes is done for the first time, for the first day. And you're ready to move on to the next, um, the next item, the next section that you may decide to work on. Now, I suggest that from there, you go to your cabinets and take a look at your kitchen cabinets. If you haven't wiped them off lately, this would be a good time to do that, to make sure on day two that you're wiping down your kitchen cabinets. Now, that may be your routine. Routine. You may do that at least once or twice a month. Just take a nice soapy solution or maybe a good microfiber cloth and a light soap con uh, condition, uh, some type of conditioner, depending upon the type of cabinets that you have. If you're wood, I like uh, wood for good and uh, spray that and put it on your wood cabinets. If you have uh, white cabinets, then certainly you may for mine, I only need to use just a couple of drops of dishwashing liquid in a huge bucket of water, wring it out well, wipe those cabinets down, wipe the handles down, and voila, the outside of the cabinets are done. And depending upon the size of your kitchen, that will decide whether that's a 15-minute task or a 30-minute task because your kitchen may have more cabinets than mine. I can get mine done in about 15 minutes. And that's even getting up and down off of my step ladder because they're tall. Now, from there, the next 15 minutes, you're going to want to open the cabinets. Look at your cabinets and see, are they a wreck? Or do you need to take a moment and kind of get things back to where they're supposed to be? Because it is so easy, so easy <clears throat> to uh, get caught up and uh, with every with different people going in and out of the cabinets, the especially the lower cabinets, the lower shelves have that tendency to be collection 
areas. And so this is a great time to get things back wherever they're supposed to be. And maybe at this time, if you haven't purged in a while, then this would be the perfect time to have a box off to the side where you can start purging. And, you know, sometimes we purge. And um, I just took a bunch of stuff to the Goodwill. Because, as you know, I was working on my dining room, and which is where we are today. And uh, I had a chance to go back through the china cabinet and to do a little more purging. And so those things that I just knew I wasn't in love with anymore, I put them in a box, took them to the Goodwill, and let them bless someone else. And so um, we, this is a good time at spring to be able to do that purge because there's probably something there that maybe this time last year you thought, ah, I'll keep that. But this year you're looking at it thinking, I have not touched that in the last five years. So if you haven't touched it in the last five years and it's not something that, you know, sometimes you have things that maybe you have a certain cup and saucer that maybe was your mom's that you want to hold on to. And I can understand that. That's not a problem. Put it in a place because you're probably not going to use it. So put it up high in a place where it's out of the way. Nobody will bother it. It looks very pretty up there. But then use your lower area for working in and out. Things that you know you're going to be using all the time. And this is a good time to get your cabinets back in order. But depending upon the size of your cabinet and depending upon the condition of your cabinet, you might need a day or you might need two days of 15 minutes. And that's a great way to use that 15 minute task. Um, Pretty Things is sharing with her that she likes to set a timer and give herself about 10 or 15 minutes to, to clean or to tidy. She says she gets a lot done in an hour. And she said her grandson takes about 10 minutes to tidy his room too. Hey, I love it because you are teaching him a life skill. And the cool thing is, is that you're not saying, okay, you got 10 minutes to get it done. You didn't have to do that. He's watching you set that timer using that 10 to 15 minutes, and he's trying to do what you're doing. So he's taking that timer. That way he doesn't think that he's really, uh, he doesn't realize how much he can get done in that 10 to 15 minutes. And, you know, the rewarding part is to look back over that job that you were working on for that 10 to 15 minutes and then it gives you a chance to say, wow, look at what I accomplished today. And then tomorrow, your next 10 minutes, you're moving on and getting on down the list. So like I said, you're going to be, they, you will be receiving a spring cleaning checklist for your kitchen. And it takes a look at all of those things that are in the kitchen that home cooks need and use every day. Now, I have already figured out my biggest problem. My largest problem is going to be the pantry. I don't know why I just can't keep that pantry perfect. And so because of that, um, my pantry has a tendency every, every, every now and then to, you know, you look at it and you go, oh, Lord, this is a hot mess. And so I have to, I have to stop. And eventually it just gets to a point where I can't stand it. And then I have to stop and work on that. So we're going to be working through that pantry because that's my biggest job. But, you know, most of the things that are on this, on this um, checklist are things that we know need to be done. And I really look at this rather than just spring cleaning, kind of an every six month type, type of thing that 
most of these things you're going to look at and you've done as a part of your weekly cleaning. You know, are you uh, cleaning off your stove and your hood and your microwave, you know, each week? Um, most of us do. Most of us do it daily. You know, it's, it's become a part of our routine. So even though it's here, this is where not only are we going to spend just a minute or two more making sure that everything is perfectly clean. This is where we're going to take the filters out. We're either going to change them or we're going to soak them, whichever the case may be. Uh, then dry them, put them back. We're going to do a deep clean of the dishwasher. We're going to do a deep clean of the oven. And uh, let's, I, I can tell you my, my oven gets used, but it doesn't get used enough that it requires that I do a deep clean every or each month. And I have liners, oven liners. Those I pull out, clean, and put back in. And as long as I use my oven liners, my oven stays pretty clean. And so, but but for spring cleaning and every six months, I try to give it a deep clean. Uh, your refrigerator is one of those things that needs to be clean. It needs to be cleaned out. Now, my suggestion is, you know, about once a month. And typically I try to associate it and put it around the time just before I do my one month my one plan for one month and to work out the grocery list, you know, work through all of that, which hint, 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 that's coming very soon for March. And uh, so be on the lookout. And um, this is a great time to be able to take things out of the refrigerator as you're eliminating those things that are past their prime, get them out, wipe those drawers out, and when it's time to do this spring cleaning, your job is not major because you've been maintaining it all along. So maintenance is, is critical to making spring cleaning so much easier. This is a time also to look at your windows and make sure that they're clean. I, I try to wipe those windows down every actually not every week but i do them every couple of weeks wipe those windows down and i have about five or six windows that are in the kitchen so because of that i've got the microfiber i've got my glass cleaner and uh, i'm ready to go and so uh and my windows fold in so i can do the outside as well as inside and it's very quick it's a 15 minute task that we can do so we are ready to uh, get ourselves pumped up, pumped up for spring. And we want to be able to make sure that uh, as we're looking at our uh, kitchen, seriously, give it a once over as far as when you're making your inventory, look at the floor, Look at those corners. Look at all of those places that when you're just doing general cleaning, you know, you're doing what you got to do. But now it's the time that if your corner looks like it needs a toothbrush scrub, this is the time you're going to get it done, right? This is it so that you won't have to do it all the time. Now, Nitty T says that she has five crocks of cooking utensils. But uh, she reaches for the same fuse, fuse so she's going to be purging. Girl, I am with you. I, I was looking Saturday as we were working through uh, Saturday morning uh, in the kitchen and cooking. And I thought, you know what? I use the same things pretty much over and over and over again. And I've got extras and... Uh, there are some things that I really do need to purge. And I think if I do that, and we'll have to do that in one of our 15-minute sections, we're going to go through it 
And those things that I am not, I, I, I'm going to give myself even a span of a month. If I don't use that item within a month, it's going in the donation box and bless somebody else. And in that way, because, you know, sometimes I'm trying to think of what it was. I picked up a, uh, I, I needed a new can opener. Well, you know, it could have been new. It was one of those that it's the, the old, the, what I call the old fashioned can openers that you get and you turn it, not the nicer KitchenAid can openers that you have. And it was old fashioned one because I wanted to put it out in the garage for the big guy. And so I went to the Goodwill and at the Goodwill, I was able to find one of those old fashioned uh, can openers that had at the end where you can, you know, it's for the, it has the bottle opener on the end and what better place than the Goodwill. And so I was able to pick that up. I, it stays out in the garage and uh, what, you know, when he's out there working in the yard, if he needs to open a bottle or a can or whatever it is, he's got what he needs right out there. And so um, someone brought that to the Goodwill and it blessed me. So I'm thinking that I'm going to bless someone else with some of these items that have been sitting for a very long time. Now, things like your... Um, your canning items. You probably you don't can every week. You probably don't even can every month. But canning items would need to stay because that's for a specific job that you know you're going to do. So as you're looking and inventorying and thinking about the things that you're going to be looking at, you can decide, do I love it? Or am I going to let it go? And so uh, don't think of just throwing it away. Now, if it's in bad shape and, and it is beyond use by somebody else, then certainly give it away. Now, what I also did, I went through my kitchen towels. My husband was doing this. You all have no idea. I am a towel nut. And I like my towels to look brand new. And when they get, get past that point of perfection, I'm ready to go buy some more. And But what I forget to do is to get rid of the ones that aren't looking perfect. And so uh, I had a um, laundry room basket full of kitchen towels that I haven't touched in, say, three years. So it was time to pass those on. And that's exactly what I did. I put them into a big grocery bag and took them to the donation center so that someone else could use them. And so think about what you can do that you can pass on to someone else, you know, I, this has been so much fun, so much fun today. I was, I, it has blessed me to be able to share with you, first of all, someone who I think very highly of with Leah Chase. I think she was an absolutely powerful woman in the field of cooking. She has influenced many and, uh, with not only her great cooking, but also her soft personality. She wasn't a soft woman, but she had a quiet, soft personality. And, you know, she was one of those women that when she said, do it, she expected it to be done. And, and I love that. So anyway, I, I was just happy to be able to share her with you today. I was also happy to be able to share with you our tips and tricks as we're setting up our um, spring cleaning and taking a look for all of that and getting ready for our spring, spring clean. And, uh, you know, after we clean, 
then we can do the fun stuff, the decorating part. So we're going to be getting all of that done during the month of March. I'm so looking forward to it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to each of you who were able to be here with us today at the lunch table. I appreciate your conversation. And Elizabeth, I see you said you had just logged on. I am so glad you made it today. And uh, please watch the replay because we really had a great time today. And uh, I am so looking forward to uh, continuing our conversation and working together with you to get, a, to get our kitchen in order and get it spick and span ready for the rest of the year or for the next six months at least. So uh, I started today with my mom's hat. We're going to get, get the job done. We're going to wear many hats as we work our way through our kitchen. So God bless all of you this week. Have a wonderful time and uh, do something fun and take a few moments and check out your kitchen. So newsletters come out tomorrow. I'm ready to go. And uh, God bless all of you. Have a wonderful and blessed week. And I'll see you soon right here from the kitchen of Ebony, Ivy, and Time.